Let's turn our hearts and our full attention to the scriptures and our call to worship in Psalm 96. And Psalm 96 is one of these psalms that was actually, its purpose is specifically to call us to worship God. Verse 1. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth, sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples, for great is the Lord. And greatly to be praised, he is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering. Come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established, it shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad, and let, its earth, let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar, and all that fills it. Let the field exult, and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Amen. Let's ask the Lord for strength and grace to worship him in a way that honors him. Please bow with me. O oh Lord, God of heaven and earth, maker of this whole world and of the universe, the only living God, the one who is powerful, mighty, all-knowing, all-wise, who never forsakes the work of his hands, who will carry out his plans to the fullest degree, and none can stay his hand. Lord, we want to worship you. We want to know that you're here, we want to sense in what we know is a very limited fashion, but we want to know and see your glory today. So, Father, we pray, come. Come on the merits of your Son and be with us. Open our eyes. Open our ears and our hearts so that we may receive your word and hear you speak that we may be silent before you. And yet then, Lord, let us praise and worship you. And let us speak of your glory this morning and to all those who hear, Lord. To, to the world, let us speak that you are the glorious and true God. And all the other gods are but idols, worthless. So, Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to welcome... You just stand with us and then we'll call the worship team up and we're going to sing to our great God. Start here with that request. <laughs>
scripture readings, uh, morning services. And we're going through the book of John. This morning we're in the latter part of John chapter 13. Jesus has washed the disciples' feet. And he's shown them that they are to seek and they are to follow the Lord's example. To be great is to be a servant. To be great is to humble oneself and to serve others and to love others. But it's shocking to see that even in Jesus' closest human friend circle of friends that you can see there's one who is a betrayer. And Jesus wasn't ignorant of that even as he called Judas to be his disciple. It was part of God's plan to bring about the salvation of the world. And yet, what a shock it is to see how even in Jesus' closest circle, there was one who Satan entered. And we're conscious that there's a danger, even in the church, in the family of God, in our families, who are regularly here in the Word of God, that Satan still has a way of getting in there. And he has a, in our hearts, with our indwelling sin, they lead us astray. They can lead those astray who have heard so much truth and who have seen so much grace. And sometimes we echo those words, Is it I, Lord? Is it I? But that's where, near the cross, daily, we must find ourselves seeking that cleansing. Because we know that we're prone to wander, prone to leave the God that we love. But we come to the one who loved us first, and we find grace there. Let's, let's read the Word of God. John 13, verse 21. After, these thing, after saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples who Jesus loved, was reclining at the table close to Jesus. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what, are you what you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he was telling, why he was, knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. And when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now also I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, so you also are to love one another. And by this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Jesus said to him, Lord, why cannot I follow you now? 
I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. We can see that even in the face of such betrayal, even in the face of not only betrayal, but also knowing the hearts of his, his true children, Jesus still loves them. He loves his own. And he loves them to the end. He will love us to the end. And Jesus gave his disciples, and he gives to us a new commandment. John calls it a new commandment here. He also calls it an old commandment in his epistle, his first epistle. But it is to love one another, just as Christ has loved us. So, let that be. Let that be front and center. And as we are loved by Christ, and we embrace and enjoy and savor that love, and we fill our hearts with that love, that we should love one another here in the family of God. Let's pray for grace that we may actually do that, not only in word, but in deed. We'll also pray for our um, missionary of the week, and actually it's not a, an individual, it's the ministry of Voice of the Martyrs, which is an important connection um, to the world uh, through their publications and through their contacts with those who are suffering persecution for the gospel. They are also our family, our brothers and sisters. And even today there are those who are in prison, who are being thrown out of their meeting places, who are being uh, beaten and even killed for the gospel. And Voice of the Martyrs is a, an important connection between many of those suffering for the gospel and those in other parts of the world that um, need to hear what the rest of the family is undergoing for the gospel. So let's pray for our voice of the martyrs. Let's pray for our little ones and also for our expectant mothers. There are a number once again. We thank God for that. And we'll... Uh, Pray that the Lord will also bless the offering uh, that we give in uh, just a little while. And we'll also pray that God will really use His Word as it's preached today. Please bow with me. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the amazing, condescending, and yet so personal love that You give to us. You love us to the end. Your love never fails. Your love has been displayed to us in that self-sacrifice, that giving of yourself, that humbling yourself, that taking on the wrath that we deserved, that enduring faithful love that even in the face of our sin, still loved us. And so, Lord, we, we want to thank you this day, even now. And, Lord, we hear your word, your commandment to us to love one another in that same way. And, Lord, we pray for your grace and your help. We are prone to wander, prone to leave the God that we love. But we say, Lord, here's our heart. Take and seal it. Seal it for your courts above. And Father, we pray that you would help us to fervently love each other. Help us to sacrifice our own rights and our own privileges and our own peace and enjoyment for that of 
others. Help us to sacrifice our lives to bring the gospel to this world. Just like you laid down your life for that. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters in so many places of this world that are suffering intense persecution. And Lord, we confess that often our hearts are, are blind to this. We have not tasted the, the scorn and opposition and violence of this world against the truth, against the gospel, against the love of God. But we know that many of our brothers and sisters in Christ are, even today, suffering. And we pray that through Voice of the Martyrs they would be encouraged and strengthened. That this ministry would also uh, stir us up to greater prayer, greater fervency in missions, greater love for the world even, Lord. The world that hates you. That we might be a light set on a hill. Even through the persecution that we may experience. Lord, work mightily in your church even today. Father, we pray that you would bless your word as it goes forth today. Not only here, but in thousands of and thousands of churches all around the world. Lord, would you speak today? Would your voice still the waters of many nations? And would it call many people from death into life? I pray that for those here today. I pray that someone here today would respond to the gospel through your Spirit's work, and they would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you would work in our children. We pray that even as the little ones go off to nursery, that you would impart through the love and the, the, the words spoken by even some of the nursery uh, workers, Lord, that uh, you love them and that they need a Savior. Father, take our children at a young age and make them yours. We pray, Lord, for those who are expecting little ones these great gifts that you've placed in our families, in our marriages, Lord. We pray that you'd strengthen these mothers. And we pray that you'd give them grace for what they will face in childbirth and in child rearing. Lord, once again, we pray for a rich harvest in our children of souls. Lord, please... Bless all our parents here and help us fervently to pray for our children's salvation. That they would be um, saved to the uttermost. That they would be also willing to stand against the opposition and persecution of this world, whatever that may be. Lord, we pray that you would also bless our offerings that we bring to you, they're just a response of thanksgiving to all that you give to us. We owe it all to you, Lord. How shall we withhold um, in giving back to you? Help us, Lord, to confess even with what we offer that our hope is not in this world or in the things that we possess. Lord, we ask you now to, by your Spirit, move mightily. Work in us. May your word take root in our hearts. May it bear forth fruit. May it be to the glory of your holy name. We pray that you'd strengthen our brother Ryan as he preaches. Lord. I pray that you would help him to know your Spirit's power, your Spirit's work in opening his mouth to make known the mystery of the gospel boldly today. Bless him, we ask. Bless the children's church as well, Lord. We pray that you would use it mightily here as well. 
In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Good morning. If you're able to, open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. This summer we're taking a little bit of a break from our exposition of Genesis. And in the first month of our vacation, uh, we are looking at the, uh, the doctrine of suffering in the New Testament and how we as Christians are to not only understand it, but to work through it. And so today will be the final message. And then God willing, uh, in two weeks' time, we'll start our second mini-series of the summer of Identity in Christ. Uh, but for this, this morning's message, what I wanted to focus on is giving instruction not merely to those who are suffering, to those who are going through a fiery trial, but to give instruction to those who are with those who are suffering, to those who are maybe a husband or a wife or a child or a close friend. How are we to minister? Or in the words of John 13, how are we to love? What does it look like to love one another? Nathan just read it providentially. By this will all people know that we're disciples of Christ. And he doesn't say by having a robust theology, though of course we need to have a robust theology. But Jesus says something very startling to our Calvinistic ears. By this will all people know that you belong to me, that you are a follower of me, that you're an imitator of me, that we love one another. And so this is instruction for us as a church this morning to love one another. And that's what Romans 12 is really going to deal with. And Romans 1 through 11 is dealing with the doctrine of salvation. And he deals with and focuses the doctrine of justification especially. And how we need the gospel to be saved. The gospel shows us how we, as estranged sinners, can be declared righteous before God. But the gospel does much more than that. The gospel shows us now how to live as reconciled sinners. Yes, we must be reconciled. But then what? Well, that's what Paul is going to deal with. Uh, I, I was thinking about... Road trips. Nathan asked me yesterday when the cases were going to take their vacation. And I am longing for one. It's been a long time. And I thought that there's two essential components that are necessary for my vacation. I need to know where I'm going. But I also need to have fuel to get where I'm going. And the gospel provides both. And if we have one or the other but not both... It's not going to be a good trip for the cases. And so we need to have our tank filled. And that's what the gospel does. Romans 5 talks about the Holy Spirit shedding abroad in our hearts God's love for us. But that genitive also reminds us that the Holy Spirit also reciprocates our love back towards God. So our tank must be filled with love. And that love comes as we focus on the gospel. Trust me, there's a rhyme to what I'm saying. We must be filled with love. It's not enough for me to say, here's 10 ways to love. No, we need to be filled with love. And then we need to express that love towards our brothers and sisters. But I also need to have my GPS saying, here's your destination. There's a lot of Christians who have full gas tanks that are not moving. And then there's others who want to get moving and they know what they need to do, but they don't have gas. And the gospel gives us both. I want you to see that as we read our text. I'm going to actually read the entirety of the chapter, though I'm going to focus on a couple verses, verses 1 to 5. And I hope that you're not thinking, this is so much scripture. Psalm 96 and John 13 and now Romans 12. Yeah, we're filling the tank. We need a full tank. It's not enough to have a GPS saying, this is what you need to do, but we need to have gas. And I hope that the text will do that for us. Therefore, I beseech you, the ESV says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, stop. He's about to give us a whole bunch of coordinates. 
Turn left here, turn right here, take this ramp off here. This is where you need to go. This is how many kilometers. He's going to show us in Romans 12 all of the directives, all of the commands, if you will, the imperatives. But those imperatives are predicated and built upon what are called indicatives or gospel truths. Don't start reading Romans 12 until you've read Romans 1 through 11. And let me just give you a warning. Don't stop in Romans 11. I'm going to beat up somebody with the doctrine of election. No, the doctrine of election is meant to humble us. Why would God choose such a wretched sinner like me? Why would he pour out his mercy on me in Christ? Well, Romans 12. This is why. For from God and through God and to God are all things. To him be the glory. God saved me for his glory. What does it look like? He is glorified now and shows himself strong in sinners who are reconciled not only to Christ, but reconciled to one another in local churches. Yep, I'm going off on my rant again. If you want to be a spiritual Christian, you need to become a committed member of a local church. It's an impossibility to grow up into Christ without the body of Christ. Paul's writing to a church. He's not writing to monks doing their devotions in the mountains on Sunday morning. He's writing to Christians doing life together. He's writing to Christians who have spouses or children or friends who are hurting. He's writing to Christians who have other Christians who get on their nerves. And so he's appealing, paracalo. I am beseeching you, I am begging you. I am coming alongside of you with a request, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God. The NIV translate, in light of the mercy. I kind of like it and I kind of don't. I don't like that it takes a plural and makes it singular. Mercies, plenty of mercies, Romans 1 through 11. Electing mercies, Romans 9 through 11. Sanctifying mercies, Romans 6 through 8. Justifying mercies, Romans 3 through 5. Glorious mercies in the gospel. Now what? I want you to present your bodies, plural, as a living sacrifice, singular. There's a whole bunch of Christians, plural, offering a sacrifice, singular. Paul's writing to a church, a local church, and they're to live together. We are individually members one of another, Ephesians 4.25. 1 Corinthians 12 says, a body has many parts, but it's still one body. And so Paul's begging you this morning, if you're a Christian, to one, get the gospel, but then two, to appropriate and live out the gospel. It's not enough to know, Paul says. This is what Paul does In almost all of his letters, he gives us glorious gospel truths. But then he says, now live it out. Understand who you are. Now live it out. You can do that in Ephesians or Colossians. I even think in Galatians. Definitely in Romans. Read Romans 12 after you've read Romans 1 to 11. But after you've read Romans 1 to 11, read Romans 12. Let me just finish. I am appealing to you, therefore, brothers and sisters. Actually, I need to stop. You can't do this. What Paul is going to say, you can't do this unless you have become born again. You need the Holy Spirit to do now what Paul is going to say. And if you boast in being filled with the Spirit, this will manifest itself in your life. This is just another way of looking at Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And Paul's going to neatly summarize everything in Romans 1 through 11 in this one word. Let love be unhypocritical. Or as the ESV says, let love be genuine. Oh, no man or woman anything but to love them. That's in the very next chapter. So you must be filled with love. And love only comes from the Holy Spirit who regenerates and seals the elect. If you're not a Christian, I'm giving you permission right now to not try to apply these things because the first thing you need to do, the first command you need to obey is to repent and believe in the gospel. Because if you're not a Christian and you don't have the spirit and you're not filled with love, 
You're trying to follow your Apple phone coordinates with no gas in the tank. And you're going to burn out the motor. You, you can't love the brothers and sisters and serve them until you yourself become a brother or a sister. You must be justified this morning. You must be declared righteous this morning. And that happens by one way. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be justified. And then you keep believing that and you will be sanctified. If you're not a Christian, you need to repent this morning. It's as simple as that. You can try to be religious, but God will not accept your sacrifice. The proverb says that the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to God. How much more when he brings with it evil intent. Apart from Christ and faith in him this morning, all your good works are an abomination to God. I told Nathan yesterday, uh, we were watching their kids and I was dirty. I was teaching them Hebrew words, or just one. And so Christine was braiding all of their hair. And as you can see, uh, that's an impossibility for me. And genetically and also because I'm a complementarian. And I said to the kids, I said, maybe she can braid my beard. And I said, that would be toeva. What is that? That's the Hebrew word for abomination. You trying to do good works in your own strength apart from Christ is toeva. It's an abomination. And the way that I helped them memorize it, which Nathan now knows, I thought of Matt um, Van Manen's little girl, Ava. I said, if you try to tow Ava, that's an abomination. That's all you're going to remember this morning. If you're trying to offer to God your body apart from regeneracy, you cannot. It's an abomination. But in light of the gospel, by the mercies of God, Paul is commanding you, Christian, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. What does it look like? I'm glad you asked. Because that's what Romans 12 through 16 is all about. It's in community, loving one another. Setting others as more important than yourself. Being there, serving, giving your life up, dying for others. Modeling, imitating Christ's self-giving sacrifice to us. Present is in the continuous sense. You don't present your body as a sacrifice on Sunday only. This is a lifestyle. Which means what? That gathering together as Christians is more than an hour and a half on a Sunday morning. It's a community. The Greek word for church is ekklesia. And what Calvinists love to do is say, well, that comes from ek, out of. Klesia, derived from called. We're the called out ones. Yes. Yes, in God's electing mercy, he calls us out of this world, out of the kingdom of darkness. Yes, he calls us into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of the son whom he loves. I got it. But that Greek word is built off the Old Testament word kahal, which means congregation or gathering or assembly. He calls us out, but he calls us in. And not just for a Sunday morning lesson. This is life together. Love requires being together. You need to be there. It's not just knowing Greek and Hebrew words as important as your pastor makes that appear to be. Be presenting. He doesn't say just show up for church, get your dump in, and then go. No. If you get the gospel, you're going to live in community, and you're going to love sacrificially. That's what a living sacrifice is. Continual, not when it's convenient only, but especially when it's difficult. When you don't feel like serving and loving, that's especially when you need the gospel. The reason why we don't love each other is because we're really not getting the gospel. How do you get the gospel? Go back and read Romans 1 to 11 and focus on the mercies of God. Read Romans 5 again. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Tacit implication. Apart from faith in Christ, there's no peace. There was a time, Paul says in Ephesians 2, when we were estranged from God. 
That we were not only strangers from the covenants of promise, but we were alienated from God's people because we did not know Christ. Paul says that we are enemies of God. That should humble us. Why me? Why would you take an enemy and reconcile me to yourself, Father, through the death of your son on a cross? This is what is holy and acceptable to God. Nathan prayed for the offering. And a lot of Christians think, oh, that's the money aspect. I gave my offering on Sunday. Oh, that's just a very small part of your offering. And he'll remember, hopefully, Nathan said, this is our offering in response to your self-giving. And yes, we should be generous financially. Paul makes that clear in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. But we are to be giving ourselves up as an offering, not just the offering of our wallets, but the offering of our lives. What is holy and acceptable to God? Well, I'm getting there. I know I'm not very good at cliffhangers. I know you're just wishing I would finish, but I'm trying to build suspense because you're like, well, what does it look like? Okay, I, I, I'm loving this gospel news. I, I understand what God has done for me. The tank is filled. Now what? Verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Gap. That's how I remember things. What is God's good and acceptable and perfect will? Paul still hasn't explained it. He's just saying, offer yourselves, your lives, as a living sacrifice. Test. And that's that word, like, dokimon. Comes from dokimadzo. It's what you do with metals. It's not you think about it, but you test it. You prove something. You want to know what is the will of God? Fill yourself up with gas and get in community and now obey this. Listen, four. Do you read your Bible slowly? I should stop. Do you read your Bible at all? If you are reading your Bible, you should be thinking through it critically. So verse 12 begins with a therefore. Praise God for election. Therefore. Verse 3 begins with the word for, which means it is now linking to verses 1 and 2. Paul's very logical. Paul, as the apostle, he says in Romans 1, I have received grace and apostleship to make disciples among the nations, to bring glory to Christ in their salvation, but also how they live together. Listen, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. That's almost identical to Galatians chapter 6. What was happening in Rome is that there were factions between the Jews and the Gentiles. And some were beginning to think they were better than others. And Paul says, you need to go back to the gospel. What is the first way we are to love others in community is not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. What will humble you? Going back to the gospel. Understanding who God is and who you were and what God has done to bring you to himself. This is a command. Do not think more highly of yourself. Listen to this. And Galatians 6 says, if you're not serving others, it's because you're proud. No, I'm just an introvert. No, you're a proud introvert. What is the demonstration of Christ's love? Well, Philippians 2 said, have this mind among yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus, who, though being in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be exploited or grasped. Harpagmon means to grasp onto something and to use it for your advantage. That's not the mind of Christ. Rather, adversative, he humbled himself, he emptied himself, he poured himself out. That's the mind of Christ. And if you're living on your own little island thinking only about yourself, you don't have the mind of Christ. You can call it introversion if you want. I call it sin. And so does the Bible. You need grace, don't you? To overcome your... I, I struggle with lust. Well, you need grace. I struggle with solitude. Well, you need grace too. We can't give excuses. There are people hurting. People hurting. 
I, I kind of had a little bit of, of, of a disagreement with one of the songs. I must tell Jesus, Jesus alone. I, yes, but you know how Jesus answers that? Through his body. That song taken wrongly almost promotes isolation. I don't need to tell anybody. I just need to tell Jesus. Yes, tell Jesus. And then tell others in the body. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but rather to think, here it is, with sober judgment, each according to the measure of the faith that God has assigned. Four. Four. So God is, is doling out grace into the church, the local church. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. Here it is. This is why we need one another. It's like a body. It, it needs everything. It needs all the digits. It needs all the organs working together. Otherwise, it doesn't function as it ought. As, verse 4, so, verse 5. So Paul's giving us a simile here. For as, in one body, there are many members, and they do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. I say this to husbands and wives as they're getting members. You don't belong to yourself. You belong to the other now, the other in whom you're with covenant. To the same extent, though not to the same application, it's true when you become a member of a church. That's why we, we, we focus on church membership here. You make a covenant. You commit to others. Otherwise, you don't have to. You can just live common law. But when you become a Christian, you say, oh, I'm bought with a price. I belong to Jesus Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 6. Yeah, but you know what? You also belong to other Christians. When a husband doesn't feel like doing the dishes after a busy day of work, dude, you belong to your wife. Now get in the dish sink. I don't feel like it. Get in the dish sink. I don't feel like coming to church. Come to church. I don't feel like serving one another. I didn't ask you what you feel like. Get that cross up and understand what Christ did for you. Now, does this sound like legalism? Perhaps. But there is, there is a great joy in imitating the Savior and self-giving for the good of others. And many Christians will never experience it because they're so content in their selfishness. You settle with the scraps of what you think joy is when Jesus says what awaits you is fullness of joy. Serving others. I want to be like Jesus. And get out of your comfort zone and one another. I came to church. That's a great start. It's a great start, but most people hide that they're hurting from 10.30 to 12.30. Put on our face, I'm doing good. Are you? Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us hide them. Very good, Noni, you're reading. Let us use them. Use your gifts. Use them. They're given for a reason. I'm cheap, but if I give my kids money to go and buy stuff, I want to share in the joy that they've bought something. I don't want them to be like, well, I knew that you're a really hard taskmaster, so I hid it under the ground. No, I gave it to you to be used. That's the parable of the tenants, Jesus says. Be a faithful steward with what God has given you. If it's prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service, then in our serving. The one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in his generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be unhypocritical. That's what I want to focus on this morning. Let love be hypocritical. What does it look like to love in community? Well, in community, there are hurting body parts. There are. There are hurting people, and we spent three Sundays looking through James 1 and James 5 and 2 Corinthians 1, and there's a plethora more of passages because God's people throughout the ages have always been suffering, have always been hurting, have always been going through the ringer, have always been experiencing trials, and it's great that we gave them a theology of suffering, but we need a theology of suffering as well so that we can come alongside. There's that word parakaleo. It means to come alongside. We need to actually come alongside because there will be times when they forget the gospel. 
So the gospel tells us not only how to be saved as individuals, it tells us how to live together once we're saved. The gospel empowers us. It is the power of God for salvation. And we always think, oh, that means justification. No, it's the power of God for salvation. Paul could have easily used the word there for justification. Romans 12 is working out our salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians 2, working out our, fear, our salvation, fear and trembling, is in community. As we live together, Philippians 1.27, as we work together in the gospel, for the gospel, we shine as lights in this crooked world. This, this is not an individualistic working out. We work out our salvation together, using the gifts God has given us, serving each other sacrificially, loving genuinely. And then I believe he unpacks what that looks like. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. You can't do that Sunday morning from 10.30 till 12.30. You can do a little bit of it. Are you in a grace group? It's great when we can get together and pray for one another. And what we desire in those grace groups is that there will even be a closer fellowship forged between some of the individuals there the church or the fellowship of the saints is not a, a nice little tack on to the Christian life it's actually essential do you love others with brotherly affection how about this outdo one another in showing honor do not be slothful in zeal be fervent in the spirit serve the Lord Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. These are, these are imperatives given in the plural. This is not just for me suffering on Monday morning. Oh, I guess I'm, I need to be patient in tribulation. I want others to be patient with me in tribulation. I want others to be constant with me in prayer. The, trust me, if you try to do this on your own, you're in trouble. How about this? Contribute to the needs of the saints. That's financial as well. And I see it, of course. Please don't think we're not doing this. But we need to be doing this more. Paul says to the Thessalonians, I know you understand the command to love one another. I see you're loving one another. But he says, do so more and more. Don't be content where you're at. So, so you're like, I'm doing this. Why is he yelling at me? Because I yell in the pulpit a lot. But I want you more, more joy, more love, more Christ-likeness. Don't settle with. Off your body every day is a sacrifice to God. And then more of your body and more of your finances and more of your time and more of your freedom and more of your comfort. Because that's what Christ did. Who did also for the joy that was set before him. Contribute to the needs. How about this? You won't know the needs of others unless you know the others who have needs. That makes sense. Kind of confused me a bit actually too. This is why we need to actually do life. One of the best books, there are lots on suffering. This is a newer one. It was written just a couple years ago by a man named Dave Furman. Actually, uh, Jonathan and Pearl went to his church in Dubai before they moved to Canada. Uh, he has a wife named Gloria Furman. And if you're a woman, by anything she writes, she's excellent. Very gospel-centered writers. And Dave suffers from a, a if any of you have seen Dispatches from the Front, uh, number 10, uh, where they're looking at missions in the Middle East, uh, actually, they interview. And so Dave Furman uh, has a degenerative disease that has to do with his nerves, and he, he can't, like, button his shirt, he can't clip his toenails. So he knows about suffering. He says it's like searing pain in his hands all the time, like his, like his limbs are on fire. So, so it's good to read from people who know what they're talking about theologically. But even, and, and he says, we just need to be there. This other book, which is good too, by Nancy Guthrie, What Grieving People Wish You Knew, she said at the very end, she says, I can, I can summarize this whole book in two words, show up. Or to put it another way, don't disappear. Love is present. It's, it's not just a sentiment. It's not hypothetical. We need to be there for one another. We need to show up. That's what love does. And that's what I want to encourage us. What is the best way that you can love somebody who's suffering? Just be there. 
Oh, I'm not a theologian. Do you have the Holy Spirit? Yes. Well, then you have something that the body needs. Let me also defend something. This is not a command only for pastors. Some people are thoroughly disappointed if the pastor doesn't show up and another Christian does. What? Where'd you get that from? Now, the pastor should if he can. But the pastor doesn't have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit. I have some gifts. Hopefully, as it were, in the prophetic. And when I say that, I mean the Word of God. I can encourage that way. But there are others who have some of these giftings and measures. I don't. And so Paul is saying, let your love be genuine. Show up filled with the gospel, prayer, praying for the Spirit to lead, and you will be a blessing. How are we to minister to those who are hurting in our midst? Well, Paul says, the way a body does. The way he says in Galatians 6.2, bear one another's burdens. And this is how you fulfill the law of Christ. Let me just keep reading and then I'll focus on a couple of verses. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. We're guilty of this. So there's a book I haven't read that I've been wanting to read for a long time, but it's called The Gospel Comes with a House Key. And she's just saying how the gospel naturally flows out when you're hospitable because it shows the hospitality of God who welcomes sinners in. There's another book that I have read. It's called A Meal with Jesus. And it traces through Luke's theology of eating. This man eats with sinners. Eating was huge back then. For us, it's just like, I got to tank up so I can go be over busy again. Back then, eating was communal. It was a sign of fellowship. To eat with somebody was to say, we belong. It's like that in many cultures. You go to the Middle East or you go to India. Strangers will invite you in and ask you to eat. It's a way of showing, I am welcoming you. We need to have a good theology of eating. And I don't know, oh, there's a, cue the, the bad Baptist joke. Baptists are always eating together. Eating together is great. Not only at church, but have people in at your house. And if your house is crazy with kids, take someone out and have a picnic. But be hospitable. These are commands. People who are hurting need you to be hospitable to them. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Listen to this. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who are weeping. Do you know there's people who are weeping in this congregation alone? They really are. Right? The book of Proverbs is, is it's an amazing thing. It says the end of, of, of laughter may be sorrow. So we can laugh, but sometimes beneath that laughter is a broken heart. And it says that a man's heart is like deep waters, but a man of understanding can draw it out. Uh, a man may put on a bold face, but what's happening under the surface might be altogether different. Weep with those who weep. That means we need to be with others. We need to be there. He doesn't say preach sermons to those who are weeping. Read the book of Job. Bildad, Aliphaz, and Zophar, they were doing great. They were doing great ministry for the first week. And then they opened their mouths trying to be the Savior. They should have just continued to weep. Weep with those who weep. It's an amazing thing. You don't need to say anything. Actually, let me give you a great quote I found uh, in this book by Dave Furman. There's a kind of ministry without words. It is simply being there. A man once wrote, who lost three sons at various times in his life, I was sitting, torn by grief. Someone came and talked to me. And I, I actually imagine myself being this guy because I often am that guy. Someone came and talked to me of God's dealings, of why it happened, of hope beyond the grave. He talked constantly. He said things I knew were true. I was unmoved except to wish he would go away. He finally did. Another came and sat beside me. He didn't talk. He didn't ask leading questions. He just sat beside me for an hour or more, listened when I said something, answered briefly, prayed simply, left. I was comforted. I hated to see him go. We don't need to be overly super spiritual. We just need to be there. 
But that means turning off YouTube, Netflix, not being on that sickening phone all the time. No, the phones, the phones are all about me. I gotta check my Facebook and, but, but, but Jesus doesn't say help one another by checking their posts or thumb upping it. Go and minister, right? Did Jesus give us a like? No, he came down, he came down and he ministered in our midst. He gave himself, he laughed with us, he cried with us, he died for us, he lived trials with us, he became one of us, yes, without sin, but he came one of us so he might be able to comfort us, to secure us. And now he does so through the body. Yes, tell Jesus. And if you're suffering, pray that Jesus would send someone into your life, would obey that conviction to love others more significantly than themselves. Back to the text. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. You know what? It's very easy to not live in harmony with one another when you just live like most people in North America. You come home from work, you park your, your car in your garage, and then you just turn on the, on the YouTube or your phone, and you just totally vegetate for the rest, and then you do that for the other six days, and then you come to church on Sunday. You need to live in harmony with one another. Live, live together, live in harmony together. And you know why it's hard to do that? Because when you get two sinners living together or two sinners getting together, especially if the sinners have kids and if you have the, especially if the sinners have different backgrounds, you, you know what you need? You need grace. You forsake that grace when you live by yourself or you hang out with people only like yourself. Exactly. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. This is James chapter 2 action. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable, what is good literally in the sight of all. If possible, so far as depends on you, live peaceably with all. So this is the directions. Paul says, be filled with the gospel. Offer your lives, plural, as a living sacrifice, singular. What, Lord, I want to know, what is your will? And that sounds great. Very spiritual, Ryan. Lord, please tell me your will. Get into community and love. What is holy and acceptable to you? Oh, that sounds so great. Get into community and love. Right? We love that. Oh, I'm reading John Owen, and that's great. Get into community, Ryan, and love. What is my spiritual worship? Oh, it's coming and raising my hands on Sunday morning. Yeah, and then it's dirtying your hands by helping somebody on Monday afternoon. This is your spiritual worship. Not putting your hand over your heart and closing your eyes and waving to a song that is catchy. Now, that's great. But spiritual worship is actually very physical. We're not Gnostics. We don't oppose doing things. We get out of our comfort zone, get into community, and we love. We love. We're filled with the gospel, and then we live out the gospel. I, I think you're getting it. Three through... Uh, uh, through the end of the chapter, that's, that's the directions. One and two are the gas. Get it. Be filled with the gospel. But don't let that gas stagnate in your gas tank. <coughs> Turn the car on now and drive. Where? The GPS is, is in this. Go and weep with somebody. Go and rejoice with somebody. Go be hospitable with somebody. Don't be haughty. Go and bless somebody. Go be fervent. Go pray together. Go rejoice together. That is how you use the gas. This is how we come alongside and help those who are hurting. Before I get into some of these practical things, I want to encourage you to read the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is so crucial in living wisely in this world. It tells you how to speak, when to speak, what to speak. It tells 
you, who to associate. It tells you how you are to use your money. It shows you how you are to use your time. Oh, that's an Old Testament book. Oh, no, these are timeless truths that the Spirit takes and he applies in light of the new covenant reality of the Lord Jesus Christ and his self-giving sacrifice. Sometimes you need to come alongside and not say something. Sometimes you do need to. And this is where wisdom is necessary. It says that the words of the wise are like a life-giving stream or a life-giving tree going back to the Garden of Eden. It says that a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and setting of silver. It's beautiful. I, I, I have no idea. This is what my note. I, I, I did something weird on my, on my iPad, so I don't even know how to get back to my notes. So we're going to close soon. But, but he says in, in another place that those who jump to conclusions in Proverbs 25, it's, it's a dangerous thing to do. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is his folly and shame. You need wisdom to someone who's hurting. The book of Proverbs is the book of wisdom for God's people to live in God's kingdom as they ought. Okay, so I have, oh man, I had all my applications here. I hate technology. I really do. I am so bad. So, I will find where I had it here if you just give me a second. Some of you can even start praying for you can, you can say, Lord, help Ryan find it soon. Or you can come and someone who has the gift of technology can help me try to find the notes that I just had. Be patient. Be patient in tribulation. This is your cross, Ryan. Bear it. And Tony's like, nope, that's not it. Someone who prayed, your answer... Some of you were praying that I wouldn't find it and I would close in prayer. Your, your prayers were not answered. <laughs> Someone who was praying, your prayer was answered. So here's ten things that Furman gives. But I want, to, I want to preface it by reading Proverbs because these are not absolute. Okay, so here's ten things. And I'll, I'll give these to you on Facebook and I'll email them to you so you don't have to write notes too fast. What does it look like to love genuinely? What does it look like to love others unhypocritically? One, don't be the fix-it person. Sometimes you do need to be. So this is general. Don't be the fix-it person. I need, to have, I need to be the guy who has that one zinger that totally just transforms their life. And they'll post it on Facebook in like six months. My life radically changed when Pastor Ryan came and, and quoted some Greek to me. No, just come and be there. Job didn't need fix-it persons. He just needed people to be there. So don't think that you have to have all the answers. Just go there and be there. Second, don't play the comparison game. And Nancy Guthrie also writes a lot about that. Let them grieve. Right? So somebody who, who's lost a dad or lost a mom. Oh, I remember when I lost. That'll come later. Just, just let them grieve. Oh, once I was so depressed. Just, just, you don't have to compare. Just be there. Okay? You don't need to fix them. You don't need to compare. Though there's a time when you can say, I've been there and I've gone through. So this is where wisdom is needed. Third, don't make their trial, don't make their suffering their identity. I'll never forget when I first moved here, there was, there was um, I'll say a professing brother. Um, and his wife was having an affair. And so we always got together and we worked through the scripture and we always prayed. And I remember he stopped and he said, I don't want this to be who I am. Because every time I got together with him, guess what we talked about? His wife having an affair. All I prayed about was that that would be remedied. And he says, I don't want to be known as this. And so we can't make suffering our identity because our identity is in the Lord Jesus Christ. This doesn't define, if you've lost, yes, we recognize it. We don't pretend it isn't there, but ultimately we're in Christ. Yes, we experience suffering, but we're in Christ. And so even Nancy Garthie says, sometimes it's fun just to laugh with people and to not always focus on it. Go and have fun. Third, don't promise deliverance now. And again, the song we sang, I, there's that line, it's like, quickly, he will deliver me. Psalm 88, it doesn't end with a nice, happy resolution. 
You know how it ends? Darkness is my only companion. Now, there is a glorious resolution. There is a glorious deliverance. And it may come in this life, but we have to be very careful of promising. That's what the health, pro health, wealth, prosperity gospel does. And it's not scriptural, and it doesn't accord with reality. You might be delivered. You might struggle with depression for the rest of your life. You might. You might not. You might. I don't know. And the answer is to trust Christ whether he delivers you in this life or you have to wait until the new heavens and the new earth and you have a new body that isn't prone to some of those discouraging thoughts. So don't promise deliverance now. Promise there is deliverance in Christ and it will come for sure, whether that's someone suffering with cancer or someone suffering with some kind of disease or someone su suffering with, with depression or, or they've lost something. It, it may take a while. Fifth, don't encourage them just to, quote-unquote, move on. Sixth, don't bring the Inquisition. That's what I'm sometimes dangerous with. Right? We start asking them all these questions, and what's the causation? Well, Job's friends did that very well. This all happened, and your kids died, because obviously you forsake the widows and the orphans. Really? His ways in the whirlwind. We have to put our hand over our mouth before God, but sometimes we need to put our hand over our mouth when we're with those who are hurting. Don't, don't be the lawyer. Seven, don't be hyper-spiritual. Don't be hyper-spiritual. And of course you do need to be spiritual, but you know what I mean, hyper-spiritual, always with like, here's a, here's a coffee mug with a verse on it. Okay, that's helpful. Just be there and... Help out practically. I thank you for that coffee cup that you gave me. It's dirty, and I'm so depressed I haven't done dishes in a week. Would you come and actually wash the, the cup instead of just give me the cup? Eight. And this is something I've learned. Don't play the avoidance game. And that's what this book is. Being there. Just, just be there. Because th there's an awkwardness that, that I've sensed. When someone's suffering, and they don't tell you they're suffering, and you're like... I don't know, am I going to offend them? And it's happened in, in, in my life and in my ministry many times. And just like, I don't know what to do. Just show up. And if the person doesn't want you to be there, they'll tell you to leave. But I guarantee you, 99 out of 100 times, they'll be thankful that you just showed up. Don't play the avoidance game. Because you know what hurts people? And I've seen it, and I've heard it from people. The trial itself is bad enough, but then feeling abandoned or isolated. That almost hurts more. Right? And, then, and then what happens is bitterness sticks in. And where's the church? The church let me down. And let me give a word of caution, actually, to some of you who are suffering. Be gracious with people if they don't show up. It's not always because they hate you or want to ignore you. It's just because they don't know. This is why we need community. That's why Cliff is constantly saying in our grace groups, Let's confess our hurts. Let's confess our sins wisely, appropriately. I get it. But it's happened to me. Like, I th I I'm on the verge of burnout. Why doesn't anyone recognize it? Why isn't everybody coming in? Maybe I just need to say what I just said. So be very careful, and especially against bitterness. I've, I've seen it, where people have gone through suffering, and then they become bitter because they feel others have let them down. They need to be gracious with you in suffering, but you also need to be gracious with them in suffering. It's a community of grace. It's, right? We need to bear with everyone. And, and the one who is suffering also has to bear with those who are not. But you see the, the necessity of community, right? I, I hope you're leaving with that. And you should be praying, Lord, would you give me a heart that throbs like Jesus for community? Number nine, don't pledge general help. Call me if you need anything. Rarely do you get that call. Uh, I remember Deanie would just come over years ago and she'd just come and clean the house. That was great. Because if she said, call me if you need anything, you know what, we wouldn't have called her. Because there's a little bit of pride about saying, well, we don't need help. Every time she cleaned our house, blessing beyond measure. So thankful. 
She didn't come and lead a Bible study. She gave specific help. She wasn't hyper-spiritual. We talked about spiritual things. She cleaned all of Christina's plethora of white pictures, innumerable. Right? Don't offer or pledge general help. Specifically, make a meal. Watch the kids. Whatever it is, something specific, something practical. Tenthly, lastly, don't condemn. Now there's a place, Proverbs says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. But Proverbs also, and James even says, hey, be slow to speak. Quick to listen. Okay, so don't come there pointing your fingers. Sometimes you just need to weep and to pray. So what does it look like to come alongside those who are hurting? Get to know them. And if you are hurting, let, let me encourage you to get into community. And if you're not hurting, let me encourage you to get into community. Because you know what happens? People who are living isolationistically from the church, they start hurting and then they're angry because nobody knows them. It's a catch-22. The poor people who can't minister to you because at, right after the pastor said amen, you're like already in your car driving home. And then they don't see you, quote-unquote, until next Sunday. Well, that's not fair. Let me give you a great quote to close this. This is how we minister to the hurting. We do so as a church. We do so as a church. And Furman says, the church isn't a gas station, but a bus. That is, the church isn't a place you swing by for a quick fill-up and then go your way. Rather, it's a community you commit to and travel with as you do life together. You get on the bus. Oh, those kids are so loud. You're on the bus. Go and love those kids instead of, like, get angry and jump out the window. <laughs> right? But it's not a gas station. And, and most Christians treat the church like a gas station. Oh, that sermon. Oh, awesome. It's like 60 minutes and he did, like, eight Greek words. That, that's great. Get on the bus. We must cultivate in our churches what he calls a culture of care, but that happens only on the bus. There's not a lot of care at a gas station. And here's my concluding application. We want to be imitators of Christ, do we not? Love, a new commandment I give you. Love one another as. It's, it's the hardest Greek word in the New Testament. As. Love one another as I have loved you. How did Jesus love us? Sacrificially, without reservation. Got out of his comfort zone. John 17, we're getting there. So you want to be Christ-like. You want to grow up into your head. The best place then to imitate Jesus' own example of coming not to be served, but to serve others is the church. Therefore, when we are saved and baptized, God's will is to place us in a local church to serve, care, and pray for others, and in some cases to die for the gospel. The reason, though, that we don't commit to local churches more than a couple of hours on a Sunday is that such service is costly. Let me say it this way. The imperatives that we work through require gas. It's costly. It's easier to not do this. The reason why we don't minister to those who are hurting is because we're selfish. We have to die to ourselves. You, you can't serve others and serve yourself on the number one. One has to have the preeminence. And I would encourage you to prayerfully say, God, would you help me to count the cost? This is not easy. You know what it needs? It needs grace. And you're like, I want more grace in my life. I have given you your answer. Go out and serve. God will give you the grace. He'll give you exactly what you need to accomplish his perfect will. You want to do what is good and acceptable and perfect? Paul has explained it to you. Get into community and love, especially those who are hurting. Especially those who are hurting. And if you're hurting, 
Pray that God would send someone from this church into your life and pray that you would open up. It's costly admitting that you're depressed, admitting that you're lonely, admitting that you're, that you're hurting. Oh, it's so unspiritual. That's just the reality of life. I'm actually glad when people say that because I'm like, oh, good. I'm not alone. I'm hurting and they opened up. Oh, maybe I can open up. And we can actually do life together. And Christ and his spirit can really manifest itself in our church so that a hurting, watching world would say, I want in on that action. So as we partake of the table together, it's more than just me and Jesus. It's the family. Right? It's not like when I was growing up, the case family when we ate, my mom's like, dinner is served. She never said that, but we would just go and we'd grab our food and then we'd go to our room or I would go in front of the TV. That's not a meal. That's just gorging yourself. But this is a meal. And the king is serving it. And the king is paid for it. And he wants us to partake of it with him at the head. Yes, but he wants everyone around. It's like a, a nice gathering, like when the burdens get together, you know, it's so nice to have the whole family there, isn't it? This is a family meal. And so I would encourage you that if you're not a family member, ask, say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I want to become a child of God, like John 1.12 says. It says, to all who received him, he gave the authority to be called the children of God. If you're not a child of God, I pray that as the elements pass before you, you would understand that you don't belong. And if you're not taking it and you claim to belong, that you would say, I need to belong. I'll do whatever it takes to sit at this feast of the king. Father, we want to just pray you give us grace. Help us to live as a city on a hill. Father, I know this hasn't been an overly theological sermon, but we just need practical ones. Lord, we want our love to be genuine. We want our love to be unhypocritical. We want to owe no one anything except to love them. That we want to fulfill the great command to love you and therefore to love one another. We want to do what Paul says, to do good unto everyone and especially to the household of faith. Holy Spirit, of course we ask that we would be filled with you. And yet, if you're convicting us of things, Lord, that are preventing that filling, help us to repent of those things. Lord, I know for me, you've been convicting me of worldliness, of complacency, of watching too much YouTube. And show me and show us the inconsistency of asking to be filled and yet not pouring out all the poison that is in our hearts. Father, help us, even as we partake of the table, to do a, a biblical self-check and to say, Lord, please remove anything in my life that is hindering this self-giving love for you and for your people. Father, we pray that as we love one another, that those who are hurting would sense your love. Father, help us to practically love one another. Help us to bear one another's burdens, to carry those heavy burdens together. Father, would you give us more of the mind of Christ? And Father, we, we pray that even as outsiders come in, they would see something at work here, and it's not just uh, guys reading Bibles and a talking pious talk, but actually believing what that Bible says and then living in a manner worthy, conducting ourselves as citizens of the gospel, humbling ourselves, being patient, loving, being gentle, bearing with one another. Father, this is what we long for. Would you give us grace to repent? And Lord, would you then give us grace to serve? Father, we thank you for this table and all that it signifies. It signifies, Lord, that we were dead in our sins, that we could not do anything to remedy our, our helpless, damnable situation. It required sovereign love, love that is found only within God, that would send his son into the world to die, not for the good, but for the bad and the ugly. Father, as we partake of this table, 
remind us that we have been reconciled not only vertically to you through Christ, but this table also proclaims to us that we are reconciled to one another, that the dividing wall of partition has been broken down and there is one new man in Christ. Remind us, Lord, and give us grace in this table to go out and to serve, even as Jesus says, that we feed on the heavenly manna. And we, we feast upon the true drink, which is Christ by faith. And put legs to our faith, make our faith practical in everyday situations. Help us to go home and to pray, Lord, what does it look like for my love to be genuine at Grace Community? What does it look like for me to outdo one another in showing honor? What does it look like for me to weep with those who weep? What does it look like for me to die to myself daily? Father, would you make this practical, so practical to us, that even this afternoon we would start living differently? What does it look like to spend my money differently for the cause of Christ? I don't know, Lord. And I wish I could apply this for another 10 hours, but I ask for those who are serious, Lord, that they would be praying now and they would not quickly forget this text, that they would pray even this afternoon, what does it look like for me to love one another? What does it look like for us as a church to minister to those who are hurting. We ask for wisdom, Father, and in faith we trust that you will give it to us generously because we know this is your will. Hear us, Lord, and bless us to make us a blessing, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. With the word of God um, that we heard of how Christ invites us to his table. He invites us. And not only that, but he's brought us into his family. Through his broken body and his shed blood, we gather around and we celebrate his love. We celebrate how he brings us in and how he feeds us. We're his, we're his family. We're gathered around the table of the King. And what a mercy that sinful people who live for themselves and who could never be brought into some, into a family that cares for one another without destroying it. He changes and he brings together in, in that love. And he instructs us to love one another. He commands us. But he also shows us how it's done. His broken body. That sacrifice for us. Let's meditate on that as we partake. And let's give glory to God. Let's love our Savior. And let's love our brothers and sisters who are partaking on this table. In the same moment, I'll ask our Brother Marvin to give thanks for the bread. And then I'll ask Brother Ryan to give thanks for the cup. Father, we thank you for giving us an opportunity, Lord, to remember the sacrifice that you made on our behalf. Lord, in demonstrating your love to us, in coming to your willingly, coming willingly, Lord, to die on the cross in order that our sins may be forgiven. Father, thank you for your great love for us. And Lord, as we've heard, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to demonstrate that love to those around us in this body of believers that you have brought together here as well. So Lord, bless this food, this bread as we partake of it. Again, unite us in one body for one purpose, to glorify you. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name.
Father, we thank you so much for your Son, or even as we've been thinking through 1 John 4, this one who is the propitiation for our sins, the one who became that atoning sacrifice that would absorb your wrath, not, not deflect it, but absorb it, that Christ would drink the full cup of your wrath, which we had earned through our sins, and he didn't leave one drop for his elect. Father, I pray that we would truly thank you from our heart for the greatest gift in the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he not only uh, died for us, we thank you that he lived for us. And the blood that he shed for us was sinless. And that he was perfectly obedient and that perfectly uh, blameless sacrifice was given in our place. Father, we humbly acknowledge that this is all of you and your grace. And it's all of Christ and his goodness. And so would you receive our thanks? Would you hear our prayers and help us, Lord, uh, to remember this, this daily? Uh, to not only remember that Christ has reconciled us to you through his blood, but Lord, this is our great confidence on the day of days. How much more, says Paul, will be saved through his blood. That we can stand before you guiltless, faultless, blameless because of Christ. Thank you that we have been forgiven of our sins. Jesus, accept our thanks and help us now as we partake. To do so with a thankful heart. A heart that is full of gratitude. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we hold in our hands this bread, this token of Christ's broken body, of which, he's, of which he said, this is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. As you take this bread, look around, maybe don't close your eyes this time. And as you eat, see the brothers and sisters of Christ, in Christ, of Christ, who he died for. Let's eat this together. And let's remember the one who bought us and who paid for our sins. Do let's do this in remembrance of Christ. Jesus took the cup after supper and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink this cup, brothers and sisters, and remember our Lord together. What an amazing love. Christ shed his blood for us and gave his body as our food. Let's sing to our Savior together. Let's stand. We'll sing what a friend we have in Jesus. Yeah. 
invitation will be out of our text this morning. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord.